Again, we're thankful to see each and every one of you, thankful you had a desire to be here, and may God's name be lifted up, and, 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 and may we receive a blessing as we go to the Lord and look into his word. Thankful again that you're here, and very thankful that you might have a desire to hear the word of God preached. The subject upon my mind this morning that I'm going to get into a little later it is pertains to the family and you know there's a lot of concern about our nation and where we're headed and the changes that have taken place over the last 50 years and also in our churches and it's not just the primitive baptist church that is seeing the difficulties of the lack of attendance and the turning away from god but i believe that the very foundation of this nation and this is according to thus saith the Lord, it's not according to the ideas that I've got, all began with the family. The institution of the family began before God instituted government or he instituted worship. And I'm going to read an article here a little bit later that was not written by Primitive Baptist. Uh, when you hear the article, you might very well think it was written by a Primitive Baptist. I found it on a website that uh, believes in the sufficiency of Scripture not only for the church, but also for the family. And I have a lot of different articles, but I, I found this one to be very interesting. But the other thing that I find today is why do people believe what they believe, honestly? You know, you'd be surprised how many people believe what they believe because, only because this is what they've heard all their life or this is because of what mom and dad has taught. We have before us in the King James Version of the Bible, I believe, the very Word of God, the only truth that you can put real confidence in in this world. You can measure your life and every situation in your life by the relevancy of God's Word. And yet I believe it's the most unread book among God's people that we have today. And I believe there's a necessary need for that in, if we're going to see things change. I want to begin this morning before we get into the family, and I'm not going to get a lot into that today, but I, I want to look at where I think we are and, and give a description of what Paul said in those days that I believe uh, is coming around again. You know, you've heard the old saying, what's been around will come around. I believe human nature and, and human beings and God's people especially have went through cycles. You can read back into the Old Testament all the way into the New Testament. Uh, as Solomon said, that that is has been done, is being done, and that is being done today, will be done in the future. There's nothing new under the sun when it comes to man. Another thing that we can be certain of, Jesus Christ has never changed. He is the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he'll be the same forever. And thanks be to God that he's that way, because if he wasn't, and he was like us, we wouldn't have any hope. 2 Timothy chapter 3, in the first five verses, This know also that in the last days, peerless times shall come. Now, some people will jump up and begin to say, well, th this is the last days. Well, it, it, it probably is. It's the last days, but I believe the last days begin uh, when Jesus ascended to heaven in his first advent. You know, notice what John says in, in John, 1 John chapter uh, 2 and verse 18. Little children, it is the last time, the last days, the last season. It is the last time, and you have heard that the Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So this idea that the world's fixing to come to end tomorrow, I don't think is relevant. I think the last days are the times from Christ, when he ascended and went back to the Father, to the time of his return. To you and I, that, that's a long time. But in when we look at it in the backdrop of eternity, it is merely days because eternity is a place where time doesn't exist. We'll have no time in eternity. When you're a born, time begins. When you die, time ends. And you're eternal. You're everlasting. Things don't change. Because of time, we see changes in our life. We're going to a place someday when time ends that there'll be no changes. You'll never change. You'll never get any older. You'll never die. You'll never have any more sorrows. So when we think about the last days, and that word perilous means difficult, difficult times, dangerous, 
I believe we're living in those times. But let's look at the description that Paul gives of these folks. And I believe these are God's children. You know, a lot of times we want to say, well, this is the wicked. But oftentimes we see that God's children over the course of time become like those who are not God's children in the way that they walk, in the way that they act. Uh, you know, we're, we're followers uh, like cattle fo- go around in a herd. Our children, if we're not careful, they want to go and do what the crowd's doing, no matter what it is, good or bad. We, we have a tendency to follow the crowd or the herd. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous and boasters, proud, blasphemers. I believe pride is, is, is one of the worst sins that we see in, in, among God's people today. You see it in, in the positive and in the negative. Uh, you know, we're, we're proud our kids are not this way. I mean, pride is promoted everywhere, and yet the Bible clearly tells us over and over in many, many places God hates pride. He hates pride. He loves humility. He hates for a man to think more of himself. But we live in a day where a lot of people are proud. It says they're blasphemers, disobedient to parents. You know, your children may be obedient to you, and if they are, thanks be to God. But we live in a society in a, in a, in a time and in an age where many children are very disobedient to their parents. They pay no regard to their parents. Unthankful, I believe this nation as a whole is unthankful. We, we're content. We, we believe we, that what we have, we deserve and we're owed. And I hate to put it in those terms, but that's how people get when you've had it good for so long. We have a tendency to not be nearly as thankful as we ought to be. We ought to be thankful for God's provisions every day, truly thankful. You know, I heard a a person say the other day that in America, young folks are so leveraged with debt, and I believe this to be true, that if you was to, if they were to lose their jobs and could not possibly find another, you'd be amazed at how many people were living on the streets in a little over two, two to three months. I believe that's the truth. We need to be thankful for God's provisions every day. You know, it tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 8, it is God that giveth thee power to get wealth. You know, some people think, well, you know, I'm just smarter. I've made better decisions. I've done all these things, and, and that's pride boiling up in a person. Look, look, I, I've done all these good things. I, I made my own way. But it is God that blessed you with that ability, whatever it was, with the strength and the power to get wealth. It says in verse 3, without natural affection. You know, I... I believe we live in a time where people are not near as compassionate to one another as they used to be. There's a lack of natural affection. We become more and more selfish as a society. It's more about me and how I feel and what I want and not about our neighbors. I remember a time, and I know many of you do here, when my grandparents were alive, there was far greater concern for their neighbor to me than there is for our neighbor today. Their well-being, not just how they are, helping them out and giving them a helping hand, doing what we need to do for those folks. It says here, in this time, and under what's under consideration, these folks that are under consideration are being described as a people without natural affection. They're truce breakers, false accusers. Uh, they're having a hard time uh, telling the truth, and if they make a vow with you or, or a promise to you, they don't have any problem breaking their promise. We all remember that when a man shook another man's hand, his word was every bit as good as any contract is 500 pages thick now that you got to sign 400 times. You shook a man's head and you said, yes, that's the way it was. Wasn't no questions about it. But it's not that way today. It says here that, says they were without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. We have a multitude of folks that are despisers of those that do good today. They despise that. This is a description of God's people and how they can get. And this has happened before, and I believe we may not be in this country, in this very situation, but if we're not there, we're, we're certainly heading in that direction, no doubt about it. It says they're traitors, they're heady, and they're high-minded. They really think highly of themselves. You know, the Bible says over and over, we ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We ought to always be humble and not think we're better than someone else or that we're smarter than someone else or that we're better looking Whatever it is we may think, that's being high-minded in a way. And then it goes on to say, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. I, I believe that we can all sit here with an honest heart and say that's a fact. Pleasures are far more loved as a whole in this world today 
than God is, even among God's people. Pleasure has taken us by storm, if it would, in all kinds of ways, to the point that we will forsake the Lord for our pleasures. It goes on and it says they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. It doesn't say these are not God's people. I certainly believe they are. They have a degree of godliness. They, they may go to church. They may uh, tell people they believe in Jesus Christ. But they're denying the power of God to make change in their life. And we talked about the family, and we'll get to that a little later, but I believe it even goes to the point of denying that the power of God's word will ultimately make a great difference in your life if you follow the pattern and the example that God laid out in his word. We live in a time, as I said, that so many folks, I, I don't believe, it, believe in the relevance of God's word. I've talked to young people that, that are going to uh, different churches. Some are not going to any churches. And, and I asked them what it is they want out of worship. They can't tell you. Some of them will say, I, I want to feel a certain way. I, I want to be zealous. I want to be excited. Well, we all want to be excited, but I think excitement is an emotion that a lot of times is played out like if, if you uh, love some sports team and, and that team wins the championship, you're, you're tremendously excited. But you look like a person going to a funeral home to, to a burial when your team loses a lot of times. And it makes you so sad that you can't hardly take it. I mean, these are emotions. These are feelings. You know, as God's children, you ought to be able to go to the Word of God. And you ought to be able to, to show someone verses in the Bible that support what you believe. Why do you believe what you believe? Is it because somebody told you and you have just went along with that for a great deal of your life? You know, think about it. Think about it for a minute. We're told of a group of folks that are God's children in Ephesians chapter 4 that are tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Do you know anybody like that? Something new comes along and they jump on it. They're not established. They're not grounded in the truth. Is the truth important? God says it is. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God cannot lie, and we believe this to be God's word, his inspired word, and I tell you, it's profitable for you and I in every aspect of our life. But when we think about the family, it is the very foundation, foundational institute in the, from the very beginning. As families fragment, break apart, fail, fail to fulfill God's responsibility given to, to the parents and, and to the children, we see a disintegration of a nation. We see our churches falling apart. You know, as, as the home succeeds or as the home fails, so goes our nation, so goes our churches. This is reality. No matter how we justify ourselves for not going to the house of the Lord or to not teaching our children in the home or whatever it is that we fail to do, I, I tell you, I, I, I'm guilty and I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to justify it because we didn't get here to where we are or where we're going by any accident. And God is not surprised. God has laid out in His Word you know, we are the greatest people, I think, or I certainly am, uh, of justifying what I do. First of all, I don't want to be convicted of anything wrong. Most people don't. And they certainly don't want somebody else telling them that they've done it wrong. But something has went wrong. We, did, we didn't get here. I mean, I, I've lived 58 years in this world, and I've seen a lot of changes when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. I was watching a, a news segment the other day, and... I think uh, there's a guy on the Today Show, Matt Lauer, or whatever his name is, was interviewing uh, some lady, I believe it was, whose son was a, a Navy SEAL. And she began to express that he made it and she made it because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know when that aired, they edited that all out? You don't think we're being attacked, and we see it every day. More so in the last 10 years is Christ being removed from every aspect of our lives. But I tell you, this starts at the very beginning. It starts in the home. We have a people who are being tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine because they're not established in God's truth. 
They're really not. We're told in John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. You know, Jesus didn't say, I'm one of the ways. Now, everybody say, well, Jesus is the way to heaven. And I'll amen that. He is the way to heaven. It's through Jesus and Jesus alone that anyone will live in glory. But Jesus said in John chapter 10, in verse 10, He said, I came that you might have life and you might have it more abundant. But the first half of that verse says, For the thief, thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. Well, the Bible's clear that no one can take our eternal life. Jesus said in that same chapter, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. That means never, ever. They shall never perish. But he said here that the thief, being Satan, can steal your peace, kill your joy, and you can live in this life as someone destroyed, unhappy, miserable. I believe I failure to understand what God's Word said and how it speaks to us, how God speaks to us through His Word. I think we're seeing the culmination of a description of God's people today who have a form of godliness, but we're literally denying the power thereof, the power for God's Word and God's instruction to change our life. Now, as we go through this sermon this morning, you think, well... I'm just little old me, my little old family, it doesn't make any difference. But I'm going to tell you right now, you, you do make a difference. Like Brother Stephen Bloyd said at our meeting, he said there may be a little group over here in New Mexico, there may be a little group over yonder, and over here and over there, they're still worshiping in spirit and truth, and it may be that God is being merciful and sparing this country because of the few. When Abraham went to, to, to God and begged that Sodom and Gomorrah not be destroyed, it got down to 10 righteous. My point is, what you do in this life can make a big difference. We got a few young folks in this, co in this congregation, but we got a lot of grandparents. You know, if we didn't hit the mark the first time, God gives us a second chance, as Brother Don says. This training and teaching is an ongoing product that doesn't just start and end with parents. It continues on with grandparents. It continues on, on with uh fathers and sisters, brothers and sisters in the church, spiritual mothers, mothers in Israel, it, it continues on. But I tell you, unless we get a hold of the family and family worship, as the Bible teaches us, we're, we're not going to see a change. I'm here to tell you right now, it's not going to happen. We're not going to wake up and everything be all right. Yes, you're going to go to heaven because you were saved by God's grace. But Jesus said, I came that you might have an abundant life. He says, I am the way. I am the focus. Do we focus on Christ? I spent a great deal of my life not focusing on him. I know that. I'm as guilty of what's taking place in our world today as anybody that you can name or see. I mean, I, I, I'm not here to condemn anyone. I condemn myself. You know, I, I've justified all my reasons. I just, and I justify them because I don't want to feel guilty. You know, there are folks who want to hear smooth things. They want to, they want to, all they want to hear is good. But when, when we read God's Word, sometimes the good out of God's Word comes from being convicted of the error of our ways and repenting. We're called to repent. We're called to make change. God tells us that our entire life will be a life of repentance. We have a description here of men and women who are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They do have a form of godliness. They probably go to church. They probably mention the Lord's name. But are they applying the word of God to their life? We're told in Deuteronomy 32 and 4, he says, He is the rock, his work is perfect. You see, when God teaches us how to conduct our lives, to raise our children, to conduct our marriages, and that's where this all begins, and, and I'm not going to get in that today, hopefully uh, next Sunday, that's where the family begins. It begins with the man and the woman. When the father leaves his, or when the uh, man leaves his mother and father and he's joined to the woman and they become one flesh. This is where the family begins and where the focus needs to be. And unless we get back to the foundation or to the basics or to the root of where the problem is and begin to 
see changes in our nation, in our society, our churches are not going to come back and grow strong because God didn't put this instruction here for us to look it over and decide whether it was the right way. He said, I'm the way. He didn't say, I'm one of the multitude of ways. I'm the only way and the only focus. You know, some people believe that if they follow Christ, I'll assure you they believe this, if they truly followed Christ the way that the Bible taught, they wouldn't have time for anything in the world. I, I don't really believe that. I believe the problem we have is, is allowing the things of the world to become more important to us than Jesus Christ. And that's easy. That, that, that happens very easily. It's, it's not easy to always keep Christ as the priority of your life seven days a week, every day of our life, in, in, our, in our families, in our homes, in our marriage. But it's, it's very important that we place Christ first and foremost. Christ said, if you do so, you will have an abundant life. Do we believe what the Lord said? Do we really believe it? Sometimes I wonder, you know, we all have unbelief. We think we've done a good job. We think we hadn't done as bad as someone else. And when we think that, that's another sign of pride. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking something like that. Well, I, I, I haven't done the best, but I haven't done as bad as those folks. Well, that's when we're lifted up in pride. You know, and, and we're not in a state of humility. He says, I am the rock. My work is perfect. The work of Jesus Christ is a perfect work. His words are perfect. There is not a better plan in this life for you and your family, you and your marriage, than what the Lord had men and inspired men to write in his word. There's not a better plan. You can go out to the bookstore, into the library, and you can take every book that's ever been written. You can read every one of them, and you'll never find a book that comes anywhere close to the teachings of God's word because it's perfect. It's perfect in all its ways. And he is the way, and he is the truth. There is no other truth. What if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Let God be true and every man a liar. I'm telling you, this is the truth that we should measure all truth by, the truth of God's word. And I'm not just talking about the doctrines of salvation. We're told to honor our parents. We're told to bring our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We're told many things about our daily walk in this life, that those truths are every bit as important as any other truths. The question is, are we applying them to our life? Have we honestly made the sacrifice as mom and dad? I didn't. And I'm not here, I'm just being honest. I didn't. It was more important for me to watch TV, to rest when I got home from a hard day's work, than to sacrifice my precious time to teach my children the way that I should have. I was tired, I was wore out, I'd been out on the farm for a long day. I was hungry and I wanted to lay back in the chair, lounge chair and go to sleep. I mean, I'm just being honest. That's the way I spent most of the years that my children were growing up. I didn't read them God's word, I didn't study God's word. And you know, when it comes to marriage, there is nothing more important than Christ in your marriage. To be the center and the focus of your marriage. If you want your marriage to end as good as it began, and I tell you, most marriages begin really good. They're really in love. It's somewhere down the road that the marriage goes wrong. If you want a good, strong marriage, Christ needs to be the focus of your marriage every day that you and I live. This wasn't a good suggestion by the Lord. This is an absolute truth. I am the way and the truth. You know, we're not to add to God's word. I want to get one verse over here, and then I, I want to read something. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, and this is just one of numerous places in the word of God that this, we have this indication. Verse 2 says, verse four, Deuteronomy 4, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Now, we're told to be established in God's Word. I made mention that so many of God's children, I believe, do not take the time to read the Word of God, and, and they're carried about by every wind of doctrine that comes along. Notice what Paul says about this in Hebrews chapter nine and verse uh, 13 and verse 9. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. 
The word established means to be stable, to be grounded, not to be carried away and blown about by everything that comes along. To be stable, to be established in the truth. It's important. As a family, there is nothing more important. As someone who began life in a new marriage, there's nothing more important than to be stable and established in God's word. Peter tells us in First Peter chapter, Second uh, Peter chapter one and verse twelve. Wherefore I will not be negligent, put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Again, he said, "You know the truth." These are folks that did know it. You know, I've come across some folks uh, in very recent times. I asked them what they wanted in the church, what they expected from the church. Uh, what, what they, they thought scripture, matter of fact, they, they didn't give much relevance to the word of God. Actually, they gave far more relevance to the way they feel. It's all about feeling. I think about those 900 folks that drank that Kool-Aid way back there with Jim Jones. You reckon that was about a feeling? Think about God's word and being established in it. To be stable. To be stable. Notice what James says. James chapter 1 and verse 8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. If you'll go read some commentary on that, it's just amazing. They say one thing and they do another. They can never make their mind up. They're confused, constantly going here and going there. It can be that way when we're not established in the truth of God's word, when we're too busy to read God's word. But I tell you, things can change, and it can change with a few he can. That ought to be the most important thing in your marriage. Not when I'm going to get a new car. Not when I'm going to get a new house. Not when I'm going to get a new anything. It's bringing your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's not about your job. I tell you, you don't have a job unless God blessed you to have it. And if you placed your job or any other thing in life as more important than God, you've erred already. You've turned away from the truth. He says, I am the way and I am the truth. I believe men and women who are God's children have become unstable because they're not grounded. They're not established in the truth of God's word. I'm going to read this article, and I don't usually do this, but I think it's very interesting. And it, my thoughts were on my mind. It's written, it was a Christian website I went to. It's not Primitive Baptist. It has no association with Primitive Baptist at all. What their idea is, is showing the sufficiency or the, that scripture is sufficient for the family and for the church. And it begins like this. Let the church become a true family again. When we begin to look at the family, the pattern that God set up in a natural sense is identical to the pattern set up in a spiritual sense. In the last 150 years, a massive shift occurred in the church and the family life completely changing the sociology of the church. This resulted in a shifting in shifting the discipleship mythology from a biblical model to a secular model, patterned after public education and youth culture. This was unprecedented in the history of the church. It was so different that it transformed the nature of church discipleship, the discipleship agenda of the family, and even the entire way the family related to the church. It actually transformed the structure of the family. It was truly a mega shift. But it happened so slowly that no, almost nobody noticed what happened. Discipleship in the church gradually became age segregated. Now, we've always talked about every age coming together in the church to worship together. Where the duties assigned to the family were handed off to church workers. You know, this is probably offensive to a lot of Christians today. But I tell you, according to thus saith the Lord, this is the truth. Whether we like it, whether we justify what we're doing or not. Why is the modern church age segregated? Why are the teenagers almost always worshiping and learning separately from the adults? You would think a primitive Baptist wrote this, but, but they didn't. They don't have any association. Probably don't even know who we are. Why are senior citizens separated from the younger generation? Who thought it was a good idea for 13 to 16-year-olds to develop their own culture? Why is it that in most churches today, the whole organizational structure is based on age segregation? The answer is simple. We have set aside the practices of the Word of God for the sake of our traditions. If we had the Bible alone, 
and nothing else. The inspired word of God. If we had the Bible only as our guide, would children be separated from their parents in the meetings of the church? Would we set up children's church? Is there any biblical explicit evidence for nurseries? Did the apostles ever organize a Sunday school, a youth rally, or any kind of age-segregated gathering? Like I said, you'd think a primitive Baptist wrote this, but they didn't. Matter of fact, I don't, I, some of the things these got people wrote, I, didn't, I don't necessarily agree with, but I agree with this. Are there any commands or examples to follow in Scripture of age segregation? Of course, the answer to all these questions is no. The disciples suffered rebuke from their master for trying to keep the children away. And that's a fact. Amen to that all day long. Let us bring our children back into the meetings of the church in a way that is consistent with both the Old and New Testaments. The current design, design for discipleship breaks the church into a fragmented sociology of interest and ages. It creates new subcultures. It actually raises a social structure that stands in sharp contrast to Scripture. Like I said, this is if we had the Bible only. As the following chapters will illustrate, the real problem, however, is that it matches poorly with the clearly communicated contours of Scripture. How do we make our way back to a biblical model of discipleship in the church and the family? We must return to the beautiful design of the church, God's design. God's ways are beautiful. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. But we all know that men throughout the ages have sought to find a better way than the way that Jesus Christ expressed things ought to be. Think about how God has ordered his people in the church. He makes them a family. You can read these like in Matthew 12, 49 and 50, 1 Corinthians 1 and 10, a body in Ephesians, a building in 1 Peter, a flock in the book of Acts. He were taught, the ministers are to feed the flock of God. A people for God's own possession. He gathers people from every tongue, tribe, nation, as brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers in faith. He brings them together as one body. They are a spiritual family. He brings them together rather than separating them according to their age. This is the beautiful design. It's beautiful in so many ways. Imagine with me a church without a generation gap. The whole family worships together. Marrieds and singles and old and young, people from whole families and broken families worship together. A little child hears the singing and preaching while in his father or mother's arms. This is a church where the biblical pattern of age-integrated discipleship is practiced. Imagine a church like the churches in Ephesus and Colossae, where it is assumed that the oldest to the youngest are involved together in discipleship, worship, celebration, and service. And the reason it's assumed is because there is no evidence to the contrary. There is absolutely none to the contrary. Imagine a church where fathers and mothers are daily fulfilling the responsibility to teach their children the word of God in their homes. Imagine a church where the excesses of the youth culture are minimized and teenagers are growing wiser by walking through life with the older members of the church. You know, we're told in Proverbs chapter 1, a wise man will hear an increase in learning. A man of understanding will seek wise counsels. Imagine a church where the fa every fatherless boy or girl worships and serves alongside mature spiritual fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers. You know, they don't say we, we won't have those things. We're, we're, there is no perfect church. We're, we're sinners. We're broken. You're going to have these things. Imagine a church where older teach the younger, the younger appreciate the older, and the older are energized and motivated by the youth. And that's a fact. When you get a church that has a lot of young people, there is an energy you can't get otherwise. It gives that to the old, but the old a lot of times have the wisdom needed to guide the young. They should walk hand in hand in the church. But I'm here to tell you this begins in the home. It begins at the very beginning in our homes. This is a church where scripture is sufficient for the discipleship of all ages. Where Christ is the focus. Where traditions bow to the word of God. And where the generations walk together and love doing so.
This is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the church become a family again. You know, I believe every word that was written there, and like I said, that wasn't a primitive Baptist that wrote it. I don't know who wrote it. I believe what it says, and I believe that we attain to that model. But I'm not sure that we are teaching our children in the home the way the Bible teaches us. The Bible says to tutor your children one-on-one. It doesn't say to take them somewhere to have them trained. But that has become what we do in life. We take our children somewhere to let them get trained because then we don't have to make the sacrifice of our time to do it. And that, that's a fact. You know, it's, it's going to take time away from whatever it is we want to do to train our children. But I tell you, I've seen some two- and three-year-olds right now who love going to church. They love praying. It's an amazing thing. You can't start early enough to teach a child. Matter of fact, I believe they learn the majority of everything they learn in the first six to seven years that they're born upon this earth. They learn what's important to mom and dad. They don't, they don't care what you say. They care what you do. What's important to you will become important to them. If the pleasures of this life are more important than God, they become more important to your children. They see what you do. They don't hear what you say. I know that to be true. If you love your children, if we love them as God loved us, that ought to be the number one priority of our lives. Divorces are rampant. Families are fragmented. Many of them are torn apart. And we wonder why society is like this. Why young people have no respect for the older people. We know that's a fact compared to 40 years ago. It's ridiculous now. Some of them don't even care. They'd just rather get rid of the old folks. Didn't used to be that way. They don't have uh, the, the they don't have the desires to help older folks that they have. It's a shame. The natural affection, the compassion. They're disobedient to parents. Friends, I'm telling you, this is not a coincidence. It's not an accident. Maybe your children or my children are not seen at that at great of extent, but there's a lot of children in this country that are, and we've seen them in action. They have no respect for authority. That all began at home. All began at home. We can legislate it till we're black in the face and we're not going to change it. Matter of fact, we got the state governments, we got the, the, the federal government legislating this stuff over and over again, but you cannot legislate morals. You cannot legislate morality. It begins in the home. When the home fails, your society eventually is going to fail. It's going to be a high-minded society. It's going to be a selfish, selfish society where people think more of themselves than they do anybody else. They don't care about anybody else. Now, I don't think we've got nearly as bad as it might get. But when we think about the description that Paul gave us there, it's something that we ought to consider every day. I know one thing, a lot of things have changed in the last 10, 15 years, 20. I know young people don't have the respect for older people. I know a lot of people declare to have some godliness about them, but I believe they deny the power in believing that God can truly change their lives. But I believe He can through prayer and through following the teachings of His Word. We can make a difference. I want to read some verses from, as I close here this morning, from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and it places the great significance of teaching our children. Now these are the commandments in verse 1, we're going to read the first 12 verses, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whether ye go to possess it. It's talking about when he gave them all these things without them working at all for them. But really that's how all things in life are even for us that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee. Thou and thy son and thy son's son all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. When we talk about our sons and our grandsons and our great-grandsons, it tells me that this process of teaching doesn't end with just your father and your mother. It continues on with your grandfather and your great-grandfather. It's... This should be a continuation in our family. And we're going to look at that 
deeper in the next few weeks as we go in deeper into the teachings of what the Word of God says about the family. It says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and deserve to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that thou may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thine soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou settest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way. And when thou liest down. And when thou risest up. I tell you what, when you read that verse, it tells me that to train up a child in the way he should go is a process and a learning and a teaching that never ends. We pass it along to our children, and our children have passed it along to their children. And as grandparents, we continue to teach it. And we do it from sunup to sundown. That, you know, it tells us in Proverbs chapter 3, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall, not maybe, he shall direct thy steps in all thy ways, in your business, in your marriage, in your family. Here it says, talk about the Lord putting first all day long. When you rise up, when you lie down, in the morning, in the night. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and thy gates, and it shall be... When the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which thou swear unto the, thy fathers, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full. Then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. You know, there's one great lesson there. When we quit teaching our children and our children quit teaching their children, there comes a day that the Lord is forgotten. I don't believe that day has arrived yet, but I believe if you look at the description given to us by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I have no doubt that day is approaching. But as it was with Gideon, he had 32,000 men the Lord narrowed it down to 300. You may think, me and my wife and my, my little children are just one little family that doesn't make any difference. But I tell you, it makes a difference in the eyes of the Lord. It makes a vast difference. It don't take many. The Lord never used gigantic, large numbers to bring about His purpose. So I want to tell you, there's nothing, no time like today to start doing the right thing. As grandparents, as parents of newborn children or young children, start training them. And it begins very early. The failure to train our children leads to a splintered society. A breakdown of the family unit leads to the disintegration of churches in due time. But many of God's children are just not established in the truth of God's Word. They couldn't take you anywhere and show you verses that support what they believe. But I'll tell you, there's one, two verses that we need to remember. We're told in 2 Timothy 3 and 16, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. Every word in this Bible is profitable for the child of God. For doctrine, that's what's taught. Many of us get that confused with the doctrines of grace. Doctrine literally means what is taught. That means every word that Jesus and the Lord taught in the Bible is profitable for you and I in some respect in our lives. Doctrine teaches us what to do. It's profitable for reproof. That teaches us what not to do. Correction takes us or teaches us to turn our lives around. And instruction in righteousness shows us how to keep the way. Scripture is very profitable. It's profitable for our children. And the longer society and the longer God's people go on without teaching their children, the further and further removed we'll get from the Lord. 
He said over there in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he said there's coming a time that if you don't teach your children and you don't rise up in the morning, go to bed at night, and the Lord be first and foremost in your job, wherever you're at, he said there's a coming a time that God will be forgotten among you. And I can testify, if you'll read more of the Old Testament, God was totally, for the most part, forgotten by the children of Israel. I've learned one thing. Solomon said there's nothing different about us than there was about those folks. There's nothing new under the sun. And don't think for one minute this country couldn't get to a point that God has totally forgotten. It could. We're not there. But it happened among the children of Israel in the Old Testament, and I believe it's happening in, in societies throughout the world as the church has moved from one country to the other. But the foundation of this church and any other church and of this nation and of this society is the family. As the family goes, so will those things go. If the family fails, don't expect to have a prosperous and ongoing society to hold up. It won't. God's word is true. God said what he meant and meant what he said. Whether we take it and, and, and to heart, and rest upon it or not. May God bless us to understand that. Lord willing, next Sunday, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin by looking at marriage because I believe that's where it all begins. A good marriage can lead to a good family. A good marriage don't always lead to a good family, but a bad marriage very, very often doesn't lead to a good family if it's a very bad marriage. And we see that all over the country. Homes splintered, people getting divorced, especially in the inner cities. They have no respect for authority. These things weren't an accident. It was a failure of the family. And may God bless us to take heed to our family and to understand the importance of our families as we go forward. If